all around the world, the ocean is under stress. We, we have to address climate change, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't um, harm the habitat that these animals occupy. Because my passion is protecting the ocean, and I have a company that's completely dedicated to that and finding opportunity to, to solve issues affecting the ocean, um, I, I'm really committed to addressing climate change and ocean acidification, and we need to move past fossil fuels and move to renewable energy. So um, I want to be part of that. I, I also think process is important and that uh, we do it in a way that, that um, makes sense, you know, and is reasonable to the people and the stakeholders and the environment. I'm a huge advocate for protecting the oceans on all different levels. Uh, I just want to see us do it in a way that will help maintain what we have. One thing that's important for us to understand is that it, for those of us that care about changing from fossil fuels to renewable energy, that doesn't automatically mean that we just go to offshore wind, right? There's a lot of different opportunities to create alternative energy and we need to, we need to weigh the pros and cons and we, we need to do that in a, in a reasonable way that's respectful to the environment and to the, to the stakeholders that are already uh, out there in the ocean. We have to address climate change but putting in an industrial scale development in the ocean, which is so important to us in so many ways, the ocean is incredibly important to us and, and so important to life on Earth. There are other sources of renewable energy. There's solar, there's wind on land, there's developing a power grid that allows a lot of the wind from the west to get to the east. That, that could happen. Um, there's, there's hydropower, there's tidal power, which hasn't been fully developed. Maybe from, for the Gulf of Maine, those are some of the things that we decide we want to use. And we decide we, won't, we don't want to go the direction of full offshore wind. Um, I happen to know what it's like to be out off the coast of Maine, in the middle of the Gulf of Maine, surrounded by whales and wildlife, and to see in 360 degrees the sea. It is magical. That's something we don't want to just give up, the seascape. You know, being out in the open ocean and being able to see in all directions the, the, the beauty of that environment, let's not take it for granted. I'm Zach Cliver. I'm uh, the science director for Blue Planet Strategies uh, based in Bar Harbor, Maine. And uh, I grew up in a fishing family in down east Maine in Eastport and worked for 31 seasons as a whale watch uh, naturalist out of Bar Harbor and uh, during my time there I led over 3,000 whale watching trips and took over 600,000 people whale watching. I grew up um, on the ocean uh, fishing and all I wanted to do was fish when I was young and then I went to school to study environmental science and wound up working as a whale watch naturalist and to me um, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to be an ambassador for the ocean, right? I get, to, I get to explain to people all about the beauty of what we have here in Maine. We have 3,000 miles of coast and we have 4,000 magnificent islands and we have 80 lighthouses and um, so I, I get to be the person that helps um, host that environment to people and to me it was it's always been exciting to, to figure out what is most important for people to hear um, what do what should they know about the fisheries and the fishermen and the humpback whale and the seabirds you know how, how do we get people excited about this uh, environment and it's been a challenge and it's been uh, a passion for me that's incredible for people from all over the world, many that have never even been on the ocean, to go offshore and to see fishermen out there at sea working hard and catching lobster and catching fish and to, to be able to have local seafood that is sustainably caught. Those generations that are to come, they should have an opportunity to continue that heritage and continue to fish. There's so many questions about how offshore wind might impact fisheries. So the, the reasonable thing to do is to start conducting 
the science and, and working with the industry to figure out what we need to know and find out the answers before we fully commit to this. My understanding of where we're at right now is that there's huge information gaps. The, the, the information and the science aren't there. We, we don't know what the impact will be and we're behind in terms of collecting the baseline information that we need to know to evaluate the ecosystem, the ocean floor, the marine life on the seafloor, the whales, the wildlife, the fisheries, and collecting the information about what's there. We need that information because then when we put wind on top of that, we can evaluate what the impact is. We can look and say, this is where things were and this is where things are now. And we all know that the Mid-Atlantic is moving ahead rapidly and that's going to be a litmus test for all of this. Uh, they're, they're going to be a laboratory for figuring out what that impact is. But of course, the Gulf of Maine is a very different place. So we need to be collecting that baseline science right now. We need at least 10 years to be collecting lots of information and working with the fishing industry, working with the whale watch community, working with seabird scientists, and, and figuring out how do we survey this environment and understand um, if there is going to be some offshore wind, how can it be the least impact on those resources, um, and how do we do it in a reasonable way um, so that we include people and that they're part of the process and we go forward together. Um, that, that is a good process and that's what we are asking from all of this. We want this process to be open, transparent and good. I'm very concerned about the process in terms of how fast this is all developing. We need to be working together now and, and that means that we need the resources to study the environment and, and help answer the questions and figure out what the impact will be and weigh the pros and cons. And my feeling is that has to happen and, and then we evaluate where the siting you know, would go and, and how much of it would happen or if it even should happen. Right? Maybe there's parts of the ocean where we decide, you know, there's too much heritage here. There's too, this, is, this is a feeding area for whales. It's not just a place where they're migrating through. The plans that are going forward and the, the questions that we have about what the impact might be, there's a lot of them, right? Um, for example, what is the, the impact on the seafloor? Um, what is that going to do to those communities? Will it reduce the amount of lobster, for example? Will, will, the, will there be noise underwater or any kind of electrification that might drive lobster away? Or do these structures actually attract fish and life? We, we don't know, right? We don't know. That needs to be figured out. Uh, the same could be posed for the issues around whales. When right whales swim into an array of these turbines, are they going to react? You know, this is a historic feeding habitat for them, where I've seen right whales spending days diving out there feeding on, on copepods, are they going to swim in and, and have a physical reaction to being surrounded by these structures and swim away? Um, how will whales, you know, move through an array like this? How, will fishermen be able to be safe around these arrays in stormy weather? What about our seabirds like gannets and, and jaegers and birds that fly high up off the ocean in the path of those blades? Are, if there's high wind, are they going to be able to navigate through those, those turbines, you know, effectively or are they in jeopardy? There's tremendous unknowns. We don't know how uh, those cables, the chains, and, and how that mooring will affect the seafloor, if it will alter the flow of water, will it change the current? Will these giant turbines be vectors for heat, to bring heat into the ocean? These are things that we, we have to figure this out. And for us, the Gulf of Maine has a 400-year tradition of being one of the greatest fishing grounds and the most magical marine environments on Earth. I think we really want to make sure that we um, protect what is sacred to us and what was passed on to us by generations of people before us. And then there's the cumulative impact of, of all those things together that really needs to be looked at too. I've been really frustrated with the process here um, in the Gulf of Maine and how little we have involved 
the communities and the, and the stakeholders. You know, I, I spent 30 years out on the Gulf of Maine collecting information about all the whales and wildlife that are there. No one's come to me. No one's asked for any of that information or knowledge. What I think is important for people to understand is a lot of times when we're doing whale watching trips going offshore, we're taking people from all over the world that have come here to see whales and wildlife. And when you're out 20 or 30 miles off the coast of Maine, that's where the water depth drops from 300 feet to 600 feet and where there's tremendous upwelling. And it's, it's some of the most productive waters uh, in the entire Gulf of Maine. It's teeming with plankton and herring and fish and whales and that is the feeding ground of the the whales and and incredibly productive and at times it's it's like the african serengeti out there where you have hundreds of dolphins and you have dozens of big whales and you have groups of whales open mouth feeding and you have porpoises all the way out all the way back and seals and puffins and seabirds and it's it's an incredibly magnificent place and it is one of our great gifts to the world that we have this heritage, that we have an environment that is so magnificent. When you're, when you're on shore, there's not as much wildlife, but when you go 20 or 30 miles offshore, it is rich. It's, it's rich at times, you know, and, and just one of the most incredible experiences anyone could have. I think it's important for the big multinational companies to understand that this community needs to be involved and this isn't just put on top of us without our involvement and input. I do think the environmental community and the conservation community really do need to hold this industry to a high standard and demand uh, a lot of it because the ocean is so important to us in, in so many ways. We really want that environment to help sustain life on Earth and be preserved for future generations. So I think if the environmental community really um, pitches in and makes sure that we work with the communities that, that use the Gulf of Maine to make sure that our questions get answered and that we are getting the right information and, and doing this in a logical process before we fully commit to something like this, it will serve us well. You know, we need to take the time to get this right. Process is important. And if you don't think so, ask the people that started the Keystone Pipeline. Now, I marched repeatedly against the Keystone Pipeline. I was completely opposed to that. Ten years ago, that project was going full steam ahead, billions of dollars, and now we've just found out it's done. And, and there's no absolute about wind power in the Gulf of Maine yet. Um, we, you know, that's undecided. We need to do this right, um, or this community is going to stand up and fight hard to make sure that it doesn't happen if the process isn't done that involves them and gets us to the answers that we need. One way that is important is the social part of this, right? We, we have to take care of the social part of this. This isn't just about the technology and funding. This, there's a whole culture here that have a lot of questions and a lot of apprehension. We need to be hearing and working together and you need to take the time to do that. You can't just ignore that piece, right? That, that, ha that we have to do. So I really hope that um, Bohm and NOAA and those that are advocating for this will we'll think about that important ingredient for success. We have brilliant scientists in the Gulf of Maine. We have a lot of people that can help frame this and do the research in a way that is effective, responsible, and, and gets to those questions and helps us understand and weigh the pros and cons. I think that uh, we really do need to find a way to balance these things and not to rush forward. We need to be transparent and we need to really bring people together and work together and not be afraid of that, you know? Uh, there's, there's apprehension, you know, like, uh, oh, these people are gonna try to stop me. No, it's about, it's about getting to the, a good decision that, that, that the community, this community, of people that live in the Gulf of Maine who are here, you know, that we, that we consider what we have, 
and, and really make sure that we, if we're going to move in that direction, that we really consider all the things that need to be considered and we don't race forward. My company, Blue Plan Strategies, my business partner and I, we hosted and organized an all-day workshop at the World Marine Mammal Conference in Barcelona two years ago. And the workshop was on the effects of climate change on marine mammals. And we had 13 scientists from all over the world that came and we had uh, 70 participants from 22 countries and four territories. And we spent the whole day hearing about how climate change is impacting marine mammals, how uh, ranges are shifting, their, you know, their habitat there is shifting, how uh, species that are in the Arctic or, uh, or Antarctica are being affected negatively by the loss of ice and the, they're losing habitat, and marine heat waves in tropical waters that are affecting reproductive health and providing uh, more diseases and, and less immunity for, for marine mammals. I mean, all around the world, the ocean is under stress. We, we have to address climate change, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't harm the habitat that these animals occupy, you know, and that traditional stakeholders have used. So I really think we need to bring science to bear and allow the public to be involved in this process and have it be engagement. We need more engagement with, with people so they understand what is, is happening and, and, and have an opportunity to ask their questions and have them answered.